So thank you, Kevin Kelly, for being with me and with us. Uh, you are one of the key speakers of the uh, former UZ event in Paris, which is postponed now next year. Uh, we've done something quite unusual for this event because it's the first year that we decide to have a theme and a question. And that question is, what does technology want? And it directly referred to one of your work, one of your book, who was entitled, it was not a question, it was affirmative, it, what technology wants. We thought this was a very, very good question, not only a question, but also the book, because it's uh, we do consider it as a, as a real masterpiece. I hope many others will follow in your next publications, but this one is really, really important for us, especially for people who are in different fields, for the corporate function, for the scientific function function for engineers. I think it's one of the main interests of the book for the society, for uh, in, uh, generally speaking. So it's a book that it's uh, at the intersection of many point of view. And so this is uh, really rare that uh, thinkers are able to be, to have a stable and interesting position at the intersection of many uh, words. So maybe concerning the title, my first question will be the expression and the question what technology wants is quite provocative, of course, because I'm sure sure you're not pretending there is a sort of consciousness or willingness behind the evolution of technology. So maybe a few words about the, the expression itself. Yes, as, as you note, I'm not suggesting that there is a consciousness intent uh, in technology. Um, I'm suggesting that there is a, a bias, a tendency that given all things, technology tends to lean in a certain direction um, and that that direction is independent of the humans who birth technology, that it's baked into the very system of the technological world to be biased in certain directions. And that because technology is so important, we should try to figure out what those biases are because we're going to do better by aligning ourselves with those biases rather than trying to fight against them. So it, you could say it's like, what are the biases of technology? Okay, that's clear. So in one way, there is a form of autonomy in the evolution of technology and being aware about this kind of autonomy lead us to a better interpretation, better adjustment to the environment in which we are living today. Because there is a French thinker, Jean Baudrillard, not sure he's, he's well known in all the world, the world, but he wrote a book, The System of Object. It was in 68, 1968. He's not the only one who said that. But the idea behind this is that he stated that in all technical objects and tools, and I know you're very interested in tools, <laughs> are uh, interconnected and interlinked. A tool never exists by itself. It always refers and, and has a meaning depending of the system uh, in which he's uh, interlinked. And you have a word, and I was wondering if that word uh, really describes what this system of object. You use the term technium. Is that what you uh, is, is that yeah. is that your idea behind? Um, about your idea that um, there's a system is absolutely correct. So in order to make a saw today, if we were to go down to the store to buy a saw, we would have, it would have been made with a hammer. A hammer is a tool needed to make the saw and saws cutting are needed to make a hammer. So there is a sense in which we can't make any of the tool by themselves. Every tool, every object that we make is codependent on the others around them. So there is no such thing as a kind of a, an object, a tool, a device, a technology by itself. All technologies are systems. And the largest system of all the technologies together forms a super system, very big system that I call, I give it a name, I call it the technium. Okay. And that's sometimes we, in English, we use the word technology in a plural sense, but that's not clear enough away from the individual technology. So I have this other term, the technium, to talk about the system of all these interrelated technologies that depend upon each other. So for your computer to work, you need thousands of other technologies to also work. For your car to work, you need thousands and hundreds of other technologies from the ones that needed to make it to the ones that need to keep it running. All those are needed. And if we look at the whole thing as a whole, that technium, 
the whole system, we find that that is the system that has these biases, that has these urgencies, because every system, whether it's a living system, an artificial system, that we make every system by definition has certain biases, certain things, tendencies. We know from computer models of systems that if we run them a thousand times, even with random variables, that they will tend towards certain behaviors over and over again, independent, again, of what those choices are. And so the technium we, is, is, is the view of this large system of all these technologies. And as we become more technological, that system becomes more and more complicated and it exhibits certain tendencies and certain behaviors that are again independent of the actual particulars i see uh would you say that you know sometimes we are talking we, we are living on earth we live in, in a biosphere and people also talk about technosphere is it yes. uh, will you accept that technosphere can be compared to technium or is it something right. very different yeah no, the, the the technosphere is the biosphere, but the one word, the one aspect, or the one character that maybe technosphere doesn't convey is that the fact this that it, it works as a coherent system. That it's not just a layer of technologies, but that it actually is behaving as a system. And so this is important in understanding our, our biological system, uh, our biology. So we talked about the biosphere and what's the critical thinking that was very revolution maybe 20 years ago was the understanding that the biosphere was not just a collection of a bunch of animals and plants. Mm. It's not just all the total together, but that it in fact works as a system and that's called Gaia. It's mm. a self-regulating system. It's a system with some degree of autonomy as a whole. So the biosphere is the behavior is the sum is greater than the parts. It's not just a collection of lots of individual living things. It itself exhibits certain living behaviors as a whole, the biosphere. And so that's why we have these issues about atmosphere and other um, large-scale disturbances because the biosphere as a whole has a certain behavior of life like. And I would say the same thing about the technosphere or the technium as a system, which is that it too exhibits some of the behaviors that individual parts of it do not. No way is you, the book behind you or this microphone or our shoes or e even a car a living entity. They're inert, they're mechanical. But the technosphere, the technium, as a whole does exhibit certain attributes of living systems, a very complicated system. Mm -hmm. And part of my book is to say, what are those behaviors that the whole technosphere, the technium as a whole exhibit? Because those are going to be important for us to try to manage it. Yes, you've made a parallel with biology when you said, uh, including in your book, if I remember it well, technology wants something, as we might say, the example that you're taking most of the time is plants want light. So the parallel drawn with biology and the living shows that the questions, it seems, uh, behind what technology wants is in fact much larger in a sense that can we say that the real question is what evolution wants? Right. Yes. So I, I would say that in a certain sense, the technium, the technosphere, is an extension of the same forces of self-organization and exotropy that have made the biosphere. So from my point of view and looking at how technology comes about, how it works, I would say that it's an extension of that. And so um, if that is true, uh, and maybe you can make an argument that it isn't, but if I, I believe that's true, if that is true, then the question is, well, what does evolution want? And that question, that evolution would have a direction or that have a bias or that it would have any kind of large scale direction at all is very controversial within biology. So there are some very hardcore biologists like the late Stephen Jay Gould who have argued for a very long time that there is utterly no direction at all, long-term direction in evolution. That is completely random. I wouldn't say random, but it's completely unpredictable and not governed, not contingent on anything. There is another set, of, and, and they are have been in more in the minority, arguing that in fact it's obvious that there are certain long-term directions, and among those primary ones is this move towards complexity. That over time these systems tend to become more complex 
complex and complicated. And so um, I'm very much in that second category. And so I look at evolution for guidance to understand technology. I say, if we look at the history of life on this planet, and the general trends that we see in life, that that will give us a good picture to say what we could expect from the technium and the technosphere, that we can apply the same parallel because in fact, technosphere is an extension and acceleration of evolution. This is why you're talking about the saying the technium is the seventh kingdom of life. The, the answer is clear. Speaking of trends, we were talking about trends, trends in the evolution and technology. You list some of them in your work. Maybe briefly, let's take some of them. You already listed some, but some may, might need some quick explanation. I've noted them. So the first one was efficiency. Everyone understand what is efficiency. Maybe you can add a few words, but it's quite clear to my point of view for everybody that a system that needs to work needs to tend and having more efficiency opportunity maybe is a few words concerning opportunity because opportunity really seems something that is the kingdom of human uh, yeah l l let me start with a few others that, that may be easier to explain one general trend in evolution that we see is that things tend to start off general and they tend to become very very specific very very specialized so in the beginning you have a cell and the cell tends to be a general purpose cell that can do many things. And over time, evolution will create very specialized cells. So in our own human bodies, we have many, I think we have several dozen, 30, 40, 50 different cell types. We have heart cells, we've got liver cells, we've got bone cells. These are all specialized cells. And in the beginning, an organism had only one kind of cell. So over time, we have specialized cells. We see the same kind of thing happening in the technium. In the beginning, there was someone invented a camera. And then over time, we decided to make a underwater camera or a camera that could see infrared or a high-speed camera. And then over time, we made a high-speed underwater camera. Camera. And we made a high speed infrared underwater camera. So we kind of, we were making more and more specialized technology become more and more specialized just as evolution tends to over time to become more and more specialized. And we have specialized organisms that can live at the bottom of the ocean near a thermal vent. And so um, that general trend is something we see both in evolution and then we can see in the technium. That spend trend from general to the specific. Another trend that we see is what I would call mutualism. And that means that in life, in evolution, more and more life tends to spend most of his time surrounded by other life and dependent on other life. So in the very beginning, life was surrounded only by inner matter materials. It was a or organism that lived on a rock. But over time, um, as more and more organisms come up, came up, you could find organisms that made their life, that made their living, either as a parasite on another organism or in codependency, where the two of them had some kind of symbiosis or other kinds of mutualism, where they depended on other species. Like if you were an animal, you depended on plants to eat. So you were, you, you were mutually dependent on them. That mutualism, that dependency on other living things became one of the marks of the living world of evolution. And we see the same thing in the technium where more and more technology is dependent on other technologies to survive and to be operating in order for it to work. In order for your car, if you have gasoline, you need the pumping stations, you need oil dr drilling, you need a whole system of things to keep going in order for that one machine to keep going. So those are two of the common kind of trends. Going back to your idea of opportunity, which is another trend, the idea is, is that over time, what evolution does is that it kind of invades every um, territory, like rock, solid rock, or up in the air, things that had no life, it will invade into those uh, places and create new niches so we can inhabit this niche. And so we actually, you know, whenever we drill into the earth for oil or something, we go into the rock, we find bacteria down inside the rock because life has figured out a way and has made an opportunity. And that opportunity of that bacteria living there will then create opportunity for other bacteria that are parasitic upon those. And so we're, it's constantly creating new niches, new addresses, new ways of making a living, new possibility. And we find the same thing with technology, that each new invention of a new technology will create opportunities and possibilities for yet others to be dependent on, on them. So we see this sort of 
blossoming this, this mushrooming, this expansion of possibilities caused by technology. There is one trend that was that may be um, a little bit more mysterious because you use a, a word which is in French, in, it's an old word, sentience. Because sentience for me refers to the ability to understand things through mm -hmm. feeling rather than uh, through minds or ratio. Or, yeah. Uh, what's the place for feeling and sentience in, in, the te in the technology? So I think one of the, one of the central perspectives that I bring to the book that maybe I should articulate is the fact that there's very few things in this realm that we talk about that are binary meaning that they're there or not there we have we have we tend to think of things like life either something's living or it's not living or it's intelligent or not intelligent or it's conscious and not conscious it's aware or not aware or it's autonomous and not autonomous but none of those that i just mentioned are binary they are actually all continuums so there is a continuum of things that are living and non-living. A virus is kind of alive, but mm, has a little bit of life, but not very much. Um, a bacteria has a lot of life, but not as much li living stuff as a, uh, an, a mammal does. So life itself, living systems, life is a continuum. It's not binary. Intelligence is the same way. It's not like something smart or not smart. There are little degrees of awareness, learning, ability to learn, ability to adapt that go all the way from very tiny amounts, simple amounts to very complicated kinds of learning and adaption and intelligence and cognification and sentience. So sentience is not a binary thing. It can be present in systems that have very weak, small elements elementary minds, like a planarium or a bacterium or a worm, they have some level of sentience. And then it goes and becomes more complicated in things like a mouse or a rat or a chimpanzee or even um, a humans or even baby. A human baby has a different kind of sentience as an, a mature adult. And so I use the word sentience to mean mindfulness, to have a mind, to be able to ad adapt, to learn, to in some ways change. And so we we know that learning takes place both within very simple animals and even plants and that of course machines these days so sentience is one thing but we do know from evolution that there is a movement where minds and mindfulness and learning and adaption has been invented has been discovered and created many times independently in life so it wants to and i say it, 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 there's a sense in which it kind of keeps happening just like evolution and invented eyeballs 30 different times independently, 30 different phylum where there was no connection to eyeballs before. It made eye, making eyeballs because eyes are very, very useful, just like a mind being able to learn is very, very useful. So it kept making, evolution kept making sentience. Um, and so it's, it's a word for learning, adapting, doesn't mean being aware, being conscious, but that too is not a binary thing. There is levels and degrees of consciousness in things and we're putting them into machines at different levels as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for this clarification about sentience. Since the early work of thermodynamics, in fact, it started at the beginning of the 19th century with Sadi Carnot in France, who worked on the efficiency of steam engines. Later on, the, co the term was coined by uh, Clausius, he named the word entropy. Then this concept goes to physics, to biology, to the theory of information with Shannon. We all know the story that uh, Shannon asked von Neumann and how can I call this constant? Uh, and he said, call, call it entropy. Nobody is understand what it is exactly. So, so you will be fine. So we cannot talk about evolution without the word, without using entropy. You use, of course, the word in your book. We know from others that there is a, the opposite of entropy. It's negantropy. In your book, you said that you rename it exotropy because it's in terms of uh, understanding, it's much more easy because entropy is a negative approach and negantropy is a negative of a negative approach. So you coined the word uh, entropy uh, based on a philosopher, an American philosopher. Uh, can remember Excellent. the name more, more maybe. Yeah. I do think that this concept is very important. On the other side, no one really, under, as uh, Van der Man told to uh, Shannon, nobody understand really it. So do you think in terms of pedagogy, we, will you keep using this word, uh, talking about entropy or forget it because no one really understand? How do you deal the, the this? Because it's something uh, in, in, in ancient Greek, we call them a pharmacon. It's a remedy and, a, uh, and so it can be toxic in terms of comprehension. So right, right. how do you manipulate this concept of entropy? We know through 
science an awful lot about the universe, but it's also very clear that we don't understand a lot of what we know. And one of the riddles still in the world is life in terms of where it came from, how it came about, and more importantly, why it comes about. Because one of the basic rules of physics that we've never seen any exceptions to is that things tend to go downhill in terms of they tend to, they start with high energy and they tend to dissipate and even out. And another way of saying it is that there's a distinction and then it becomes undistinguishable. It becomes gray. We often talk about the kind of heat death and we think of it as black, but it's a better version of it would be gray. It becomes undifferentiated. There's no difference between anything. As long as there's differences, that's work, that's potential. And so in a curious way, which we don't understand, the universe sort of started with differences and now it's going to head down to no difference. And that's called the heat death. And everything we've seen, every example we've seen no exceptions to that process. But even though that process is universal of things running down or becoming undifferentiated, we do see a pot we do see pockets in the universe where that where differences are created and increased at the cost of accelerating the decreasing around it. So as a net gain, there still is a decrease. But within that closed system, we see these little areas where the order increase. Order is another word for that difference. Difference. That is actually life. So even though the universe is kind of running down on at least one planet in one galaxy, we see the order running up and it runs up at the price of accelerating the decrease indifference around it. So there is, it still obeys the rule, but not locally. That local increase that is going against sort of the general thing, that heat death, that that downward slope is called entropy. The exceptions is called exotropy, going up. And again, it works by increasing the entropy around it. So your computer, when it's calculating, that is doing work, it's increasing order, it's making pictures from numbers. The cost of that is that it makes heat. Heat is generally seen as something, as evidence of the fact that it's becoming um, flat, dissipating. It's becoming undifferentiated. And so the smarter and smarter your computer becomes, the hotter and hotter it gets, the more and more heat it's making. That's the cost. And that's true right now. As you're listening to this, your brain is generating heat. It's, that's why your body's warm, uh, because you're doing processing, you're, you're making exotropy. So my point is that this is a little miracle where what we find is that these systems like life that can maintain this can actually keep increasing their order by increasing the ex entropy around it and that special magic that happens is where uh, technology comes from so technology is is actually an accelerated version of the exotropy all the processes that we know about life where where, where you are self-organizing and making more order and in, in generating more heat doing so has been accelerated by the technium and then as we make more and more complicated technology we'll make more heat and we'll make more uh, disorder around it as as the cost for doing that. And so it's obeying exactly the same principles of evolution. But the, 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 the point is, is that it's kind of an exception to the general rule of di increasing disorder in the world. We have this thread of cascading or bootstrapping where each ratcheting is another term they often use, biologists, where we ratchet, we go forward and we don't go back very much. We keep going more and more complicated and we have a system that is, and from the physics point of view, unusual because we're making more and more order. And it, but to do so, we need like a pyramid. We need to stand on all the other things that we've made before in order to do the next thing. Are you aware about some companies in the business world, people who might say that I measure the level of entropy, of exotropy that I produce in my business model or in my... Could, could we imagine that one world, day-to-day -day people will... Because in the IT field, in computer science, for example, we'll talk about technical debt and technical debt is compared to a form of entropy. But do you see, do you, can you think of business that can be based on the analysis of entropy and exotropy? Is yeah. that, does that make sense? That is possible. But the problem is, is we actually have very great difficulty in actually measuring these things in very large systems. It's very hard to measure how much exotropy a system has because it is a measure of possibilities. And like if you were to ask somebody, what's more complex 
a uh, uh, an Apple or a Boeing 747? It'd be a very difficult question to even answer. Which which has more exotropy in it? And so um, we don't have tools, and we, we're working on some of those tools right now among computer scientists and others to try to define that. And there's some terms like logical depth, which is in some kind of a sense of like how many, how easy is it to compress something? Like, could you compress the structure of an apple into something small? And in fact, you could in a certain way. It's called a seed. Can you compress a Boeing 747 into uh, something like a seed? You might be able to with the documents, but actually. Actually, a lot of that knowledge is in people's heads. It's not even ever written down. So there's a challenge to that. The, the, the impulse and the desire is there to kind of do that. But we actually don't know enough about these large systems to be able to do that yet. Um, we have some ideas that are, people are trying to use to measure complexity, to measure exotropy, to measure these things. But we're still pretty ignorant. Okay, you wrote, after what technology wants, correct me if I'm wrong, but The Inevitable was uh, the book that you released just after. I have a distinction in mind concerning tendencies, because we talk about tendencies and facts. I'm working in the computing fields, and as you know, technology and, uh, is also a market. So there are also analysts that want to predict what is going to happen, what will be the next killing technologies, etc. I have the feeling that sometimes they make people who trend, tend to predict what is going on, which is not the, your case. This is why I'm asking you the question. Yeah. I make the distinction between the tendencies that have some kind of necessity and the facts. I can predict the tendencies, like when you say I can tell you that the future will be take whatever you want plus artificial intelligence and you have the business model of the I don't, I don't know how many hundreds of uh, the next startup but predicting the facts when exactly will it happen this right. is much more complicated and there is no necessity on that point will you agree that one mind to make this distinction between the tendencies that has a kind right. of necessity and the facts and we, we cannot predict the facts but we can sure. predict the tendencies 100% agreement another way of saying that is that the 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 forms uh, of technology and evolution are much more inevitable, but the species, the particulars, the specifics are inherently unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could uh, arrive on another planet that may be an Earth like gravity, and we could predict pretty well that they're probably going to be quadruped, four legged animals, because four legs is a very inherent, attractive form governed by physics. We could not predict whether there'd be a zebra or not, because, because it's very clear that quadrupeds are inevitable but zebras as a species or not. And so so we can talk about the inevitability of forms that we know minds, artificial minds are inevitable, but the particular species is not inevitable. And another visualization I like to use is, is if we can imagine a valley and there's rain coming down the valley, it's raining. And when, 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 when a raindrop hits the sides of the hill, that specific path of that raindrop as it comes down the hill is inherently unpredictable. But the general direction of the path downward is inevitable. That's a good metaphor. <laughs> so, so it's be going to go down. We, don't, we can't predict where and how, but we can say it's going to go down. And so that is that the form, the general trend is inevitable. The specific species, particulars are inherently unpredictable. So we could say that the telephone, that any planet, any civilization that discovers electricity and, and wires will, will invent the telephone. That's inevitable in any course of any civilization. But the iPhone was not predicted. That particularly as species, as specifics. So, so we don't want to try to talk about the specific and the species level. We can talk about the trends and the and the, the general forms, and those are really what's inevitable. One last thing about that. Yeah. That means that we as humans don't have much choice in whether or not AI comes, whether or not there's going to be flying cars, whether or not there's going to be um, genetic engineering. As long as we keep making things, they're going to be made. But we still have a choice in the character. So even in choosing the species. So even though we don't have a choice about the fact that we have phones, we do have a choice about the character. What kind of phones do we want? Who's going to run the phone system? Is it multinational? Is it international? Is 
Is it for profit? Is it commercial? Is it open or closed? So we have a lot of choice about the specifics and those make a huge difference to us. So while we don't have a choice about whether AI comes, we have a lot of choice about the character of the AI and, and we can choose that. And, we, and those choices will make a huge difference to us. So saying that things are inevitable does not surrender our need to steer them, to create what we want, to domesticate them, to civilize them. So, so we have a lot of, we have a big domain of making choices, even though these larger forms are inevitable. So that it means there is still a place for deliberation in this, uh, in this trend for, for humans. The last question, uh, a fan question. What will be your next book? What are you working on? Can we have some information if you want to share it with us? Sure. Um, I'm working on a book that I'm just finishing that has nothing to do with future technology and has everything to do with the past. It's a book called Vanishing Asia, and it has 9,000 images that I have taken of the disappearing cultures in Asia between Turkey and Japan. And um, it's about a world that has very little technology or mostly handmade technology that's disappearing very fast. And the, I'm not nostalgic. I don't miss that stuff because what we have is better. But there is a beauty in it that I wanted to capture first. And I think there's some value in this otherness to us now in the ways that people made things by hand, uh, made huge cities, entire cities without any power tools. There's no vehicles. They were only walking. And, and I had the privilege of living in those and photographing that time machine. And so this is a book about a world with very little technology. And it's a reminder for me about what technology gives us. And that's called Vanishing Asia. And I'm just finishing that right now. I've been uh, writing about the mirror world, which was not in The Inevitable. And that's another inevitability that I see coming in the next 20 years. Not now, it's decades away. But it's where we make a virtual map, a uh, one-to-one -one map virtually of the real world. And we overlay the real world with this virtual world. So it's different than cyberspace and virtual reality, which are kind of imaginary worlds that are set off. This is a ghost, a twin a digital twin of the real world embedded into the real world. So it's the fusion of the real world and the virtual world at the same scale together inside so that you wear smart glasses that allows you to see this mirror world, this, this ghost world, this twin. And we can do all kinds of things with it from games to navigating to learning. And so things like uh, learning physical things, like learning how to weld, you could have a teacher's hands that you are trying to mimic. Um, they could also be, an expert could be looking through the same eyes that you are and giving you directions, whispering what to do. Or there could be some kind of a form that shows you move your hand this way. That's one way you can learn. It's great in terms of repair work because it's complicated stuff, like a surgeon can see what needs to be done. Those are one of many new super powers that we're going to have when we have these smart glasses. So smart glasses, is, is sort of the thing that's after a smartphone. Um, and it will take a long time for this to become something that you and I will use every day. I think people will see this first at work, depending on what they do. But I think the the, the consequences, or the kinds of things, the, 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 what's the word I want? The social ramifications are large. There are a lot of issues about privacy. Um, there are a lot of issues about ownership and intellectual property, about who owns this. There's a lot of um, computer science work and done on the interface. So how do we how do we navigate through this what, 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 what's the metaphors that we're going to use? So there's a lot going on and I think it's going to be, I think in consequence, it's going to be very similar to what the internet and the web have done, but more so. And so I'm trying to figure that out. I'm not sure it's going to be a book because, and I'll tell you why, very few people are reading books anymore. I don't want to do a book with words on a page. My children and all their friends watch YouTube to learn. Mm -hmm. They're not reading books to learn. So whatever I do next, I want to do in that medium. So even though I might do a big idea stuff, it's not going to be a book first. It's going to be video okay. first. And then it can become a book because moving images is the center of our culture right now. And I want to be there at the center. You already started because I've seen your YouTube channel and uh, yes. I've seen photographies of uh, Vanishing uh, Asia in Twitter. So uh, And people can have a look at the article that you publish in Wired uh, concerning the, the Twin Words. Thank you very much for your time, Kevin Kelly. It was a real pleasure to have you during uh, during all these minutes. Thanks a lot, and uh, well, see you soon. Let's next year in Paris. You know.
um, it's always a joy for an author when someone like you has read his work as closely and as well as you have, so you can have really great questions. And I really appreciate your reading and your understanding of my work. It's a real pleasure. I hope that I've been able to explain it for others to understand. And I, I appreciate the opportunity that you have given me to help people embrace what we're making because if we don't embrace it, we don't get to steer. See, the only way that you can steer technology is by using it and by participating. If you try to reject it or turn it off, you don't get to steer it. I preach an embrace of this. Not everything, you can select things, but we have to embrace it in order to steer it because if we don't, we don't get to steer. So I appreciate the time to, um, to talk about it. Thank you.